So a very warm welcome to all of you for joining us once again for the Darcy Lectures, the final of the series of eight. Um, and these uh, Darcy Lectures, as you know, are offered in collaboration with Georgetown University Press. My name is Father Nick Austin. I'm the Master of Campion Hall. And it's been very good to see that so many have remained with us for this demanding lecture series for all eight lectures. We've had between uh, 45 and 110 each webinar, and over 100 seem to have been following on the YouTube channel as well. People have joined us from the UK, from Ireland, from other countries in Europe, from the USA, from the Philippines and elsewhere. So I think it's been a tribute to our Darcy lecturer for this year, Dr. Patrick Reardon, uh, as to how engaging the lectures have been, and it's been very good to have you all with us. This week's lecture then, the final of the Father Martin Darcy SJ Memorial Lectures 2021, is entitled Fraught Issues Today, Integral Ecology and Humane Economy. A reminder to post your questions in the Q&A section at any time during the talk, and we'll have a chance for some discussion uh, towards the end of our hour together. So now over to Patrick for the final of his lectures. Patrick. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. And I echo also your words of, of uh, thanks and appreciation to those who have stuck with us in this discussion. At the beginning of this series of lectures, I outlined my project as an attempt to show that it is compatible with the Catholic faith to espouse a liberal political stance. At the same time, I wanted to take issue with authors who present the common good as a sectarian or ideological concept in a polarized debate in which liberalism is seen as the enemy. In opposition to movements such as integralism or political Augustinianism, I wanted to defend a Catholic understanding of common goods that is comprehensive enough to embrace a variety of political stances, including a liberal one. Central to my approach is a positive evaluation of liberalism, understood as a tradition of thought about how societies should be governed that is predicated on the centrality of human freedom. And human freedom is a fundamental good. And any form of government that respects and promotes and facilitates human freedom is capable of being a common good. From the Catholic tradition, I have focused in particular on Gaudia et Spes from the Second Vatican Council, Pope Benedict on the dignity of the human person and her fundamental freedom, and also on Pope Francis's encyclicals, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. Our explorations in these lectures have suggested the following. Last week's discussion of Aquinas saw his analogical use of the notion of common good such that the common good of a state could appear as limited or restricted. The human made law of a political community would not ambition making people good in an unrestricted moral sense, but would focus on a more limited agenda of securing the society's survival and preventing harm to its members. Similarities with the thought of the liberal John Stuart Mill were noted. The question was raised in an earlier lecture about the kinds of political system that would be most appropriate to Pope Benedict's emphasis on the dignity of the human person. His emphasis on the person being of transcendent value and warranting the rights acknowledged by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A liberal regime that espoused the values of the person would have to be a candidate, even though the church does not endorse any particular philosophy political philosophy or ideology. Discussion of political Augustinianism showed that Augustine's theology can be read such that the secular is not opposed to the sacred. A spectrum of possibilities can allow the case where the secular is open to the sacred, facing towards God, and not only the opposite pole where secular means rejection of the religious. Illiberal secularism is not the only form and is objectionable on standard political grounds of unreasonableness. In this final lecture, I return to the rejection of liberalism 
and to the criticism of John Stuart Mill to situate the discussion of fraught common goods of integral ecology and humane economy. Patrick Deneen, you'll recall, he wrote the book, Why Liberalism Failed. Patrick Deneen blames Mill for many of our problems. He claims that the world we live in today is the world Mill proposed. He supports this claim by pillorying Mill's opposition to custom, his advocacy of experiments in living, and his elitism. In my view, custom is not to be defended, but is objectionable if it is relied upon as an answer to a challenging question, why do we treat women this way? Or why are black people treated this way? Saying, well, that's our custom is not a satisfactory answer. And Mill is right, out, is right to point that out. As for experimentation, he was not recommending that we experiment with drugs or with casual sex or with financial speculation. But in his context, given the many innovations, technological and political, that were causing upheaval in 19th century Britain, it was necessary to find ways to adjust. Not all attempts at accommodation would be successful, and it would be important to test what works and what doesn't, according to Mill. His model for experimentation is the scientific one, expecting a strict recording of performances and outcomes. Of course, his elitism needs to be criticized and amended, but I believe that Deneen's treatment of him is unfair. Take, for instance, the following passage from Mill's Consideration on Representative Government from 1861. Mill is contrasting the citizen of Athens and the modern citizen as to their democratic credentials. Note that the sentiments expressed here in this quotation are worthy of Deneen himself in bemoaning the deficiencies in our modern experience. The ancient Greek citizen was called upon to weigh interests not his own, to be guided in case of conflicting claims by another rule than his private partialities, to apply at every turn principles and maxims which have for their reason of existence the common good. He is made to feel himself one of the public, and whatever is for their benefit is to be for his benefit. The modern individual, he goes on to say, the modern individual never thinks of any collective interest, of any objects to be pursued jointly with others, but only in competition with them, and in some measure at their expense. A neighbor, not being an ally or an associate, since he is never engaged in any common undertaking for joint benefit, is therefore only a rival. Can we not see Mill as a possible ally in upholding the importance of common goods, of public interest, and in resisting the atomization of social order to the private interests of individuals? This is how I regard him. And I read his proposals on experiments in living differently than Deneen. I follow Elizabeth Anderson and Robert Kane, two philosophers whose reading of Mill on this topic presents a very different picture. Kane, a philosopher renowned for his work on free will, follows Mill in shifting the emphasis away from autonomy, the unconstrained exercise of choice, to the progress in discovery of what is good. Knowing the good, the discovery of what contributes to our well being and good functioning is his focus. You'll hear the echoes of Aristotle in that. Liberty is a condition for the pursuit of the good. It is not itself the point of it all. John Stuart Mill is most widely known for his advocacy on behalf of liberty. It is commonly forgotten, however, that for Mill, liberty was not an end in itself, but a necessary condition for the discovery of forms of life that were conducive to human well-being. And that discovery required freedom of speech and open debate to test the validity of claims made. Elizabeth Anderson has suggested that we should consider Mill as having himself been an experiment in living. 
Mill's attempt under his father's guidance to live according to Bentham's philosophy, pursue pleasure, avoid pain, led to a breakdown which drove him to reshape his life and to revise his understanding of the good. It was both a crisis of life, since the pursued good of happiness was not achieved, and it was a theoretical crisis, since the espoused theory could not explain the suffering encountered. My point here is not to claim that Mill has succeeded in formulating a comprehensive account of the good. The point instead is to acknowledge his achievement in recognizing the process of discovery and in developing a social philosophy open in principle to the discovery of ever more satisfactory accounts of the human good. Is it plausible to suggest that a whole society might engage in the kind of experiential learning that Mill envisaged? Is this not what is essentially Patrick Deneen's concern, that we would review the experience of liberalism and its failure to deliver on its promises? Far from Deneen's interpretation of Mill that everywhere at every moment we are to engage in experiments in living, it is much more a recommendation to review our history as if it had been an experiment, to evaluate our performance and our experience and learn from it. Deneen evaluates the experience of living under liberal regimes very negatively and proposes pathways to alternative lifestyles, such as the Benedict option. I'm going to turn now to Pope Francis and Laudato Si on integral ecology. I'm not going to claim that Pope Francis was influenced by Mill, but I hope to show the similarities between what Francis does and what the liberal author proposes. As is widely acknowledged, Pope Francis uses the see, judge, act model to invite us to reflect on our experience, to identify where we have gone wrong, and to seek alternative pathways that might help us correct our mistakes. See, attend to elements of our experience, judge, provide analysis in terms of causes, and act, develop prescriptions for action. We don't have to review the survey of environmental devastation and the impoverishment of many of the world's marginalized societies. We're aware of that, and this has become even more part of our consciousness following the synod in the church on the Amazonia region. So I move straight away to the judge phase where the critique is offered. A focus of Pope Francis's critique in Laudato Si is the technocratic paradigm as a mindset that sustains the exploitative behaviors of humankind in relation to its planetary home. Pope Francis points to the need for a review of common, assum common assumptions about the good and calls for a critique of operative conceptions of the good in economics and politics and related disciplines. The need for critique is evident from the dynamics of resistance and rejection with which philosophical challenges are rendered politically powerless. Francis is aware of these difficulties as signaled in the encyclical, where he comments on the blocks to real dialogue and insight, usually leveraged by vested interests. Can economic rationality or the technocratic paradigm be part of the solution and not only cause of the problem? Might a solution be found not by constraining the market, but by expanding it so that the critical environmental goods are given their price and the costs must be met when the goods are destroyed? This is what a market for carbon or institutions of cap and trade attempt. Pope Francis in Laudato Si writes, politics must not be subject to the economy, nor should the economy be subject to the dictates of an efficiency-driven paradigm of technocracy. Today, in view of the common good, there is urgent need for politics and economics to enter into a frank dialogue in the service of life, especially human life. So an approach juxtaposing the market society with its standards of economic rationality and a deliberative society pursuing questions of the, the meaning of the good life for which the economy is merely instrumental reaffirms central concerns of Catholic teaching. 
For instance, Pope John Paul II in his letter Centesimus Annus of 1991, marking the centenary of Rerum Novarum insists, the economy in fact is only one aspect and one dimension of the whole of human activity. If economic life is absolutized, if the production and consumption of goods becomes the center of social life and society's only value, the reason is to be found not so much in the economic system itself as in the fact that the entire sociocultural system, by ignoring the ethical and religious dimensions, has been weakened. This pithy statement locates the economic within a larger sociocultural system and expects that the values of the market would be subject to other values. Similarly, in reflecting on the end of the Soviet Union, which, like liberalism itself, was another big experiment in human living, Pope John Paul II did not celebrate the victory of capitalism, but noted how it could only be supported if embedded in a strong juridical framework. Asking whether capitalism could be endorsed as a model for development, he offers a qualified but positive answer. The qualification is that the freedom in the economic sector must be circumscribed within a strong juridical framework which places it at the service of human freedom in its totality and which sees it as a particular aspect of that freedom, the core of which is ethical and religious. This challenge is now highlighted in the context of the global environmental crisis. What can be the appropriate strong juridical framework? What should be the relevant values in relation to which economic activity should be evaluated? Where might be the locus for determining the required umbrella structure? Combining these two perspectives, Mill's liberal philosophical analysis of the requirement to learn from our experiments in living, and John Paul's demand that our economic activity be constrained within a strong juridical structure, we can sharpen the question in terms of common goods. What can we learn from our experience of how economic activity delivers or fails to deliver common goods for our societies? Among the many meetings prevented by the COVID pandemic in 2020, was a meeting of young entrepreneurs and economists in Assisi called by Pope Francis for March last year. The Pope's letter of invitation stated as the purpose of the meeting that the safeguarding of the environment cannot be divorced from ensuring justice for the poor and finding answers to the structural problems of the global economy. We need to correct models of growth incapable of guaranteeing respect for the environment, openness to life, concern for the family, social equality, the dignity of workers, and the rights of future generations. In other, in other writings, Pope Francis labeled neoliberalism as belonging with the models that need correction. And neoliberalism he understood in terms of individualism, consumerism, globalized technocracy. It belongs among the frequently mentioned bet noir of contemporary social critics and reformers. And so I move on to ask, how is neoliberalism different from political and economic liberalism? And what is wrong with neoliberalism? Liberalism accepts the need for regulation. The enforcement of competition is one major reason why regulation of markets is warranted. Far from Adam Smith being a defender of unregulated markets, as is often asserted, he believed that regulation was essential to protect the populace and to oblige the merchants to compete. Appropriate regulation, preventing cartels and ensuring competition, would be an important element of the necessary regulation. But there are other reasons why regulation in various forms can be needed such as in the standardization of weights and measures and in the prohibition of harmful products. It took the Adulteration of Food and Drink Act of 1860 in the United Kingdom to stop publicans putting salt in beer and bakers chalk dust in bread in England. 
imagine that British brewers putting salt in beer and bakers putting dust in bread, chalk dust. Competition between the brewers or between the bakers seeking their own self-interest did not do the trick because consumers could not identify the flaw in the product and so it could not choose their supplier as an alternative, an alternative supplier. So competition wasn't going to solve the problem. Another example from 19th century history is that of Samuel Plimsoll, who is an English politician and social reformer, MP for Derby at one point. To him, we owe the Plimsoll line, a line painted on the hulls of ships to mark the limit of safe loading. His efforts were directed especially against what were then known as coffin ships, unseaworthy and overloaded vessels, often heavily insured, in which unscrupulous owners risked the lives of their crews. How ensure that only seaworthy and properly loaded ships would take to the sea? After over 10 years of agitating, the Plimsoll line was adopted as the solution. It was visible and overloading was recognizable before ever a ship left port. That's a regulation regarding safety and conditions of trade and we would not want to see it removed. Tragically, it took a long time to have it adopted since British ship owners were well represented in Parliament and they were content to recoup the insurance and were not at a financial loss when ships foundered with loss of cargo and crew. Regulations of various kinds are part of doing business, but neoliberalism fundamentally rejects regulatory constraint as essentially harmful. Where liberals of different hues were able to accept necessary regulation, neoliberals are opposed to constraints in principle. This is a simplification and exaggeration, but the experience of recent decades bears out its core of truth. Deregulation is the catchword of the program of reform initiated in the era of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan that has carried through into the 21st century. Regulations of every kind are targeted and removed. And so we can ask, how has the restructuring of the juridical framework by the policies of deregulation advanced or jeopardized the common good? And so in the next section, I'm going to review four instances. First of all, regulation of banking. Professor William Kingston of Trinity College in Dublin records how limited liability was first introduced in an Irish law in 1782. And its purpose was to facilitate investment in innovative technologies with a view to producing useful goods and services. That Anonymous Investors Act ensured that in the case of failure, the liabilities incurred by businesses in creating and marketing their product would be limited to the extent of their initial investment. Prior to this, personal responsibility for debt was the norm. In cooperative ventures considered as partnerships, each partner was jointly and severally liable for any debts that might be incurred by their business. Because this system of unlimited personal responsibility by each of the partners was a major deterrent to investment in innovation and industry, it was changed. However, the Irish 1782 Act explicitly denied limited liability to bankers and to others dealing in money. And this denial was copied in the British 1855 law, creating limited liability. You'll recall that the Irish and British parliaments had been combined in 1801. French, Spanish, German, and Belgian legislators adopted the policy later in the century. New York had adopted it in 1811. However, Lobbying by financial interests in the United Kingdom achieved a reversal of the exclusion of banking in 1879, even though the good reasons for the exclusion had not lost their plausibility. What were those reasons? Why exclude banking from limited liability? It re recognized that dealing in money is significantly different from dealing in goods. In the latter case, holding stock is a cost, while in the former, holding money is not a cost. This constraint on banking activity ensured that bankers were assiduous in determining loans. They would take care to whom 
and on what conditions they lent money, since they and their bank were at risk of losing in the event of bad debts. The success of financial interests in achieving a change in the law reflects a dynamic that will function throughout the subsequent century, juridical constraints in place to ensure that the market functions to serve the common good, including the good of investors, are weakened or dissolved in favor of the interests of financiers. The original purpose of limited liability was to facilitate technological innovation and the development of industry, including the building of the railways. And the assumption behind this was that the satisfaction of human need is for the common good. However, the change in law favored the interests of financiers rather than those of industry and the common good. Instead of financing technical innovation, owners of capital can choose to speculate in financial products. In effect, the poachers had succeeded in getting control of the law the gamekeepers relied upon to protect the common good. The same dynamic is evident in the later change in the laws regulating the responsibilities of auditors. A fascinating example is how accountants made rules to suit themselves. Professor Kingston narrates how the auditing accountancy profession succeeded in getting the publicly established standards of best practice changed to standardized box ticking procedures. This replaced the requirement that professionals exercise personal judgment. As a result, practitioners are freed from personal liability for mistaken judgment. Now all they need do to protect themselves is to demonstrate that required procedures were followed. Another change in standards which had very negative consequences for the public good was the restriction that auditors only had to report actual losses incurred by a bank or business and not any expected losses. As a result, auditors were signing off on the accounts of banks which were due to make serious losses and in some cases to fail. But the auditors had nothing to answer, they claimed, since they had complied with requirements. A defense which the House of Lords inquiry into the 2009 banking crisis in the United Kingdom did not accept, but could do little about. As Kingston reports, self-interested parties succeeded in capturing the lawmaking processes and shaping the focus of concern. In the second case, the American deregulation of banking, we find something similar. The history of the financial crises in the 21st century can also be understood in terms of this lobbying by sectional interests, which had already attained political and social respectability in the movement of deregulation initiated in the Thatcher and Reagan era and imitated in the World Bank with catastrophic consequences. From Enron at the start of the century to the subprime mortgage bubble in 2007-08, the failure of regulation due both to the policies of deregulation and the incompetence of such regulators as were in post resulted in great harm to the economy in general and the common good, but with few exceptions left the financial sector intact. Of course, there is something to be said in favor of deregulation. Some regulations introduced to protect consumers or to encourage competition had unintended negative consequences. Some systems of licensing and patenting created monopolies and prevented competition. But other regulations initially introduced to prevent catastrophes such as bank failure or a repetition of the great crash of, 20, of 1929 and the subsequent depression of the 30s were removed without consideration of the consequences. One of the lessons learned in the United States after the 29 crash was the wisdom of separating commercial and investment banking. The Banking Acts in the United States of 1933 and 1935 required banks to opt for one or other designation, and those registered with the Federal Reserve as commercial banks offering loans to customers and taking deposits were prevented from engaging in trading in stocks. They were prevented from dealing in company stocks, either on behalf of customers or for themselves. They were prohibited from underwriting or distributing such company shares or affiliating or even sharing employees 
with companies involved in such activities. On the other hand, these regulations prevented securities firms and investment banks from taking deposits. Banks of all kinds put pressure on legislators to remove these limitations, and eventually with the adoption of deregulation policies, they were freed from these constraints in their pursuit of profit. The collapse of the banking sector in the 2007-08 catastrophe was the direct result of, the, of this deregulation. George Soros uses strong language in speaking about those who are responsible for the crisis, unscrupulous lenders, predatory practices, and the regulatory authorities lost the ability to calculate the risks involved. The same inability to really understand what was happening led the rating agencies to take the same easy way out as the regulatory authorities. They simply believed and repeated the self-assessment of issuing banks. Soros's main target is the market fundamentalism which favored deregulation and confidently assumed that the markets left to themselves would bring about a satisfactory situation for all. The general weakening in the regulatory regime coincided with the development of new instruments for packaging and marketing debt. These were made possible because of new technologies in computing and mathematical modeling. Just at a time when complexity and speed required new forms of regulation, the regulatory authorities were being dismantled as a matter of policy. The impact of the crisis is undeniable. And thirdly, value taking by the financial sector. Mariana Matsukato, professor of innovation at University College London, challenges the standard justification for the takings of the finance sector, which is that it contributes to the efficient allocation of capital to productive investment opportunities. Her book, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, follows on from earlier publications in which she challenges the assumption that the private sector alone is responsible for the creation of wealth. Studies show that most established firms finance their research and development from internal resources, such as retained profits, and do not depend on financial markets. Furthermore, initial financing for startups is rarely provided from the finance markets. Investors only willing to become involved once chances of success have been, have been established by initial performance. And it is in this context that she observes that the enormous expansion of the finance sector if it were contributing to the efficiency of investment in productive activity, might be expected to have resulted in a corresponding growth in returns on productive investment. In fact, she records that only 15% of the funds generated in financial markets go to businesses in non-financial industries. It appears that the enormous earnings in the finance sector are largely due to the churning of stocks by fund managers who benefit by charges on purchases and sales, regardless of whether these have any impact on productive activity. Matsukato's study also shows how this development in finance has infected the industrial sector, since any proposals to invest in new production will be compared with rates of return on the financial markets. And so resources are, diver are diverted in some cases. And fourthly, the World Bank and deregulation. The ideology of deregulation was adopted by the World Bank in the 1980s and imposed on developing countries as a condition for receiving development support from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. As a former chief economist at the World Bank, Joseph Stieglitz confronts the uncomfortable reality that the bank's policies in insisting on privatization, deregulation, and the removal of protective measures had catastrophic impacts on the economies of many developing countries. And instead of resolving crises in many cases made them worse. As the title of his book suggests, the dynamics of globalization appear as destructive rather than productive because of the features associated with neoliberalism. These are the ideology of deregulation, the systematic removal of constraints on the free operation of market forces, 
that is, the liberalization of trade and financial markets, and the demand that state intervention be minimalized. The Vatican's 20, 2018 statement, Considerations on the Economic Financial System, echoes this same concern. Where massive deregulation is practiced, the evident result is a regulatory and institutional vacuum that creates space not only for moral risk and embezzlement, but also for the rise of the irrational exuberance of the markets, followed first by speculative bubbles, then by sudden destructive collapse and systemic crises. If we take Mill's suggestion seriously, or Pope Francis's See, Judge, Act, we have to review this and similar histories to establish what happened, evaluated in terms of who benefited and who was excluded, and what was the impact on human goods and social life, and then determine what is to be done. In doing this, our political deliberations will not be able to avoid conflict. The initial conflict is to be expected in the attempt to rescue politics understood as the management of conflict by talking from being colonized by the rationality of economics. Are there signs that the tide is turning when the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, publishes a book about values? Carney's book resonates with that of another eminent public figure, Jean Tirol, the 2014 French Nobel Prize winner for economics, who in 2017 published Economics for the Common Good. In both cases, respected figures familiar with the worlds of business, finance, and government regulation argue for the need to balance markets with morals. They have slightly different terms. You're all advocating the common good as the horizon, providing markets with their purpose. Carney arguing for values as delineating the comprehensive context in which the distinctive economic values should be situated. Both arguments are welcome as reinforcing the Aristotelian and Catholic appeal to ends and purposes to enable us to transcend the bounded rationality of economics. However, in both cases, the argument is weakened by a poor mastery of ethics, and the case needs the complement of an elaborated account of human goods and values and of common goods. Both authors agree that a simplistic utilitarianism is unsatisfactory, but that is not enough to provide a robust account of human goods, of values, and ethical principles. Still, we must be grateful for every ally who sounds the trumpet against the dominance of economic rationality and pleads for values and ethics. My one complaint about Mark Carney is that he is just a little too nice. He has plenty to say about how markets can contribute to solutions. But his remarks about how financial markets in particular have caused the problem are very general in tone. He describes how markets can go wrong and how Following the global financial crisis, many supposedly rugged markets were revealed to have been either cosseted or corrupt. But this does not deliver the kind of analysis that would help identify the source of problems. He does not engage in the review of these experiments in living that Mill demanded. With reference to the purpose of financial markets, Carney writes, financial capitalism is not an end in itself but a means to promote investment, innovation, growth, and prosperity. Banking is fundamentally about intermediation, connecting borrowers and savers in the real economy. Although he mentions Mariana Matsukato's book, he does not at all engage with her arguments that financial markets facilitate taking and not the creation of innovation and prosperity. She documents how small a proportion of finance as mediated by the markets is directed to facilitating innovation. Investors only direct their wealth to new enterprises once they have proven their success. Perhaps Carney is too nice also to his former employers and possible future colleagues in the political establishment. 
there are helpful suggestions in his book about regulation and what it might achieve and what it might require. But there is no analysis of how the, how the deregulation policies of recent decades have removed constraints that had the purpose of securing values against economic dominance. In his book, in the index, we find regulation, but not deregulation. And so I come to my conclusion. It may still be a far off dream that the deliberation about the kind of society and public life people aspire to will effectively constrain the economy. But in anticipation of the realization of the dream, there is a task to be completed in recovering and cultivating a literacy in the good and the goods of common life. So that where and when deliberation is possible, citizens are well resourced to express their vision and aspiration. For this purpose and to meet the task set by Francis in Laudato Si, we need a fuller account of goods appropriate for articulating our vision and our values. The reforms Francis calls for require not simply a relativization of the technocratic paradigm, but a revision of the understandings of the human good that pervade all our human sciences and our economic and political practices. In terms of the myriad goods in common, there is no shortcut in the form of a convenient rule of thumb or litmus test available to determine the justifiability of actions or programs. In concrete cases, participants must be able to enter into a detailed examination of what is proposed and what might be expected consequences, both intended and unintended, and so provide an evaluation of the action or program. Robust public discourse is required and not the technological application of some preformed instrument of decision making. It will be evident from my argument so far that I am not upholding a conception of common goods as a solution or panacea. It does not provide us with a content from which we can deduce or otherwise derive solutions to our pressing problems. It is much more useful as a tool of analysis and its role is programmatic. The, pro the, the common good in its most generalized sense, I introduce as heuristic, naming something we are in the process of pursuing and discovering on the way. But the fact that it is still only vaguely known, essentially unknown, does not entail that we have nothing to go on. We have two criteria that can help us to identify failings and limitations in our efforts to date to achieve common goods. These two criteria have philosophical formulations. No persons or groups to be systematically excluded from a share in the goods we pursue together. And no genuine dimension of human good be excluded from our joint efforts. In the parlance of Catholic social thought, these two criteria also appear as solidarity and subsidiarity. As noted in the lecture so far, these discussions have been largely provoked by an upsurge of interest in the common good in a wide literature in several disciplines and areas of concern. I share many of the concerns that have motivated the literature, but I'm also worried that the notion of common good that has, been an that has an established place in Catholic social thought and is a pillar in the church's engagement with modernity is in danger of being hijacked to serve a sectarian call. It seems to me that we do a disservice to the notion of common good when we employ it in a partisan way, as if only one side of the debates and conflicts could pursue a common good. Pope Benedict himself referred to the classic polarization of liberal individualism and communitarianism as sterile. If the label of the common good becomes associated exclusively with one side of an issue, as for instance, in the critique of liberalism, then it will be compromised for its use within Catholic social thought. I hope I have managed to show that it is conceivable to incorporate liberal ideas and principles and the writings of liberal thinkers within a Catholic vision of common goods. And perhaps I have exemplified by my use of Mill's writings how we can demand of liberals that they are more liberal, that they are more faithful to liberal principles. 
thank you once again for your attention. Thank you very much, Patrick, uh, for the conclusion of your argument. Um, so now we have some time for uh, some questions. So please do place your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin with uh, one of my own. Uh, your, your approach, although you haven't talked uh, about Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen and the capabilities approach, um, it, it's not totally dissimilar in some regards. And there's a bit of a dispute in that sort of approach about whether we need a definite list. So Martha Nussbaum, as is well known, advocates uh, a list of 10 capabilities such as um, human life, human play, emotion, and so on and so forth. Um, you, you've argued very strongly for the idea of literacy in the good, for the need for us to come to a fuller account of the good, yet it seems to me you've resisted coming up with a list. Can you explain why that is? Do you think a list might be a good idea? 10 basic goods or something like that? Yes, a list, a list is very helpful. And uh, I think it was in, I can't remember, was it the fifth or sixth lecture where I referred to Martha Nussbaum? Okay. It's where we got onto the problem of essentialism and the way in which she had defended her approach about what, how, how do we recognize our fellow human beings? Uh, we have to have some conception of what it is to be human. And she offers her, her listing of uh, capabilities for functioning. Um, and that, that's a foreshortening of what had been the classical approach to the understanding of nature from a differentiation of objects, we get a differentiation of actions, from a distinction of actions, we have a distinction of potencies, from a distinction of potencies, we get the possibility of describing natures. Now, she focuses in on the potencies, those capabilities, uh, because there's the anxiety, and it's a very understandable anxiety, that if you're too specific about what are the permissible objects of action that, are, that you are going to constrain people's liberties. However, do we constrain people's liberties more by refusing to address the question of that listing of dimensions of human goods? Or it seems to me that by failing to address the complexity and attempting to map out not a necessarily exclusive or comprehensive way, but to map out the complexity in some form, we, risk, we run the risk of having everything reduced as we've seen with a Benthamite utilitarianism or an economistic uh, satisfaction of preferences where there is no reflection whatsoever on what are the objects of preference or the objects of desire. And one of the things that of course I would be concerned about as comes up in my second um, criterion of the common good is, you know, as a Catholic, as a believer, as a priest, I want our questioning about the human good to have an openness towards the, the religious, the divine, the encounter uh, with God's revelation and the possibility of living a life in response to that as a good life. So I'm quite happy to explore um, listings of the good. And in one of my books, I think I, I surveyed some of that literature. Um, Professor Oderberg from Reading University is one of the ones who has done that very well. In his, in his book on ethics. Okay, thank you. Perhaps another, another question. You uh, entitled this particular le lecture for to issues, not just in a, a humane economy, to, to do with integral ecology. And so you've mentioned environmental issues and so on. Um, in Pope Francis's Laudato Si, which you've referenced a number of times throughout the, the lectures, um, integral ecology is one of the key ideas. Do you agree with certain authors who, who see that we need to expand the idea of the common good to include non-human beings, for example? How does the idea of the common good contribute to the whole discussion of integral ecology and the connection between what Pope Francis, following Leonardo Boff, calls the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor? Yes. Do I detect a hint there of reference to the cosmic common good? Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah, excellent. Well, last week's lecture, I tried to make the point about how our speaking about common goods has to be analogical. 
So that has been part of our whole tradition and very well exemplified in Aquinas in, in that text, in those questions where he's exploring the meaning of law and he's able to distinguish very, very different communities, including the community of all creatures that has a common good. And then there's the common good of all rational creatures as the common good of um, the citizens or members of a particular political community. Uh, or any cooperation that's going on, you and I are cooperating now, and many others not visible on screen are cooperating with us. Uh, we have common goods. We have goods in common in doing this cooperation. So as long as we're able to use the language of common good analogically, then it's possible to advert to, say, that cosmic common good. In the particular book where that is done, where that phrase is used very, um, uh, yes, very em emphasized, what I miss is the analogical appreciation that, uh, that the term has to be usable in that context, but also has to be usable when it comes to, for instance, the relations between borrowers and lenders in an economic enterprise. They have goods in common um, that uh, we can identify and we can see when the common goods are actually distorted to benefit some at the expense of others. Okay, thanks. And I suppose just uh, integral ecology is, is one particular dimension of things, but uh, uh, another question um, concerns, you know, many other issues that we're facing uh, today as we go forward, not, not least in a, in a COVID, post-COVID uh, context. So are there, are there any particular major issues that a common good analysis could contribute to how we address them, uh, major issues that we're facing together going forward that you'd particularly like to highlight? Um, I don't know, I don't think I can really offer very much there. I mean, my role as a philosopher tends to be doing housekeeping in our use of language uh, and trying to help make communication and argumentation and discussion more fruitful by helping people to understand one another. So introducing distinctions and clarifications and the kinds of clarifications and distinctions that are relevant, I think, to the topics of integral ecology have to do with um, being able to distinguish between commons and good and bad commons and common goods um, and public goods. These are useful categories and they are distinguishable, but they help us to identify where there is something that can be done, that we are called upon to do, that we can take responsibility for. Um, one of the real temptations that there has been, and this in its own, this idea on its own would require a whole further set of lectures, but one of the temptations has been from our development of human sciences, of economics, uh, sociology, and law perhaps also in related disciplines, one of our temptations is to think that modeled on the success of natural sciences, we can predict what will happen as a result of our actions and we can control what will happen. And reflecting on our experience and recognizing what has gone on, we, we have to admit that we're very bad at predicting and very bad at controlling. And Doing that, predicting and controlling, uh, might not be the best way forward for achieving what is good, integral ecology. What we can do is try and weed out from experience what are the traps and the dangers which, if we don't advert to them and pay attention to them, we are likely to bring about unintended consequences that we would rather not see. Um, in the um, media today in the newspapers, there's a story about these uh, salt flats in, in high up in the Andes that are going to be uh, jeopardized and impact on the ecology, on the environment, also on local communities, as a result of the need to mine for um, lithium battery, which is essential also for the new technologies to avoid um, production of carbon. So if we're going to rely on storing 
electricity, storing energy. We're going to need more lithium batteries. We're going to be pushing people into um, investing in uh, mining that will inevitably have an environmental uh, impact. And so we have to measure up all of them, <laughs> measure those possible indirect consequences and not simply cheer and, and, and uh, welcome all investment that's possible in an alternative technology. So that's the only thing I would, I would point to, you know, from my work, it's about uh, trying to get clarity in what it is we say we are doing and then trying to help to recognize what are the traps we are in danger of falling into as we explore and attempt to find ways forward. Good, thank you. And it's, uh, yeah, the, um, it's not the, these questions of relationship of control and prediction is perhaps not the best way forward in terms of addressing the ecological crisis uh, is a, a very helpful one, I think. Just a question from, uh, from the participant here. If following Benedict, the distinction between communitarianism and liberalism is facile, is it fair to criticize neoliberalism without identifying which voices in neoliberalism are being singled out? Which, neoliberal, which neoliberals do you have in mind? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, the, the word was, was sterile, the debate was sterile. And of course, I should, I should um, be much more uh, willing to identify who are the, the neo neoliberals with whom I disagree. But I, look, let me, let me take the, the, um, the, all the evidence that's presented by Patrick Deneen in his book, Why Liberalism Failed. And you can see the uh, evidence that's there that um, the failure to deliver on promises where uh, what has been brought about has been a standardization rather than a rather than a facilitation of plurality. Um, I'm, I'm speaking at this level in, the, in, this le in these lectures, in this lecture particularly, about the evident impact of a certain set of policies that has been detrimental. Um, so Margaret Thatcher would have appealed to, to Hayek uh, in justifying the case she made for freeing up markets and for uh, limiting regulation, for deregulation. That's one economist that one might mention, Frederick Hayek. Um, okay. But I agree, I accept, I accept that is, a, that is an exploration and a set of discussions that needs to be conducted. Okay, thanks. And perhaps just finally, uh, could you summarize in a very brief uh, sentence or two what the main thread of your argument throughout the, the series has been? Well, let me just remind, remind you of that uh, image of the accordion that I used uh, in last week's lecture, and I've referred to it again indirectly now, the, the idea of the use of the language of common good as uh, analogical, so it can be expansive or, for, or focused, we can be concentrating on a narrow set of cooperations, or we can be looking at a broader range of cooperation in all cases where we are working together, where people are cooperating, they have a good in common. And they may not know all that can be known about that good. It can be a heuristic concept, but there are two criteria we can rely on to oper operationalize that concept, who gets left out and which human goods get denigrated. So that's the thread running through it all. Great, well, thank you very much, Patrick. And I'm sure I speak for many to say that I've uh, I found your lectures engaging your language clear and your argument compelling and i'm sure many of us will look forward to seeing your thoughts on the common goods theological philosophical and political aspects in print in the very near future to all who have attended the lectures this year i'd like to mention that the martin darcy lectures are an annual series and uh, next year we're delighted to be welcoming the globally renowned catholic theological ethicist Professor James Keenan SJ from Boston College, Massachusetts. Jim will be presenting his vision of the fundamentals of Catholic moral theology today. And so that promises to be a very exciting, even unmissable theories, series. Although I would say that as someone who 
has benefited from Jim's men mentorship as many others have. So please do look out for next year's Darcy Lectures and other events that will be taking place throughout the next academic year at Campion Hall here in Oxford that will be available either in person or online. Thanks once again, Patrick, for a wonderful uh, series of lectures. And on behalf of Campion Hall and our partners, Georgetown University Press, thank you to all of you for joining us from uh, very, very many different places and for uh, persevering, for persisting, for enjoying uh, these eight lectures together. Have a very good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.